Mr. Robert Duzarek, uh, distinguished and dear participants, uh, we welcome you all to today's dis uh, discussion on Abe's security policy and implication for South Asia. The Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent, apolitical, and non partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy, and a world free from conflict. We envision a world where sources of insecurity are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved, and peace is advocated. To talk on today's interesting discussion, we have Mr. Robert Luzarik. Robert is Director, Institute of Contemporary Japanese Studies at Temple University Japan campus in Tokyo. Until 2007, he was a visiting research fellow at the Japan Institute for International Affairs in Tokyo. He was a 2004-2005 Council uh, on Foreign Relations, Hitachi International Affairs Fellow in Japan prior to taking his current position. He spent 10 years in Washington DC at Hudson Institute, where he authored several publications on Northeast Asian security issues and chaired the Korea-Japan Luncheon Group and co-authored report on Central Asia and Europe. He also participated in a National Institute project on North Korea. His latest book written with General William Odom is uh, entitled America's uh, An Adherent Empire, which is published by Yale University Press in 2004. He's a graduate of Harvard College and holds an MBA from Yale University. Besides directing the Institute, Robert is a frequent contributor to the public debate on Japanese affairs and international political and economic issues. Uh, writes often open on uh, different journals and magazines and uh, give talk at different uh, uh, think tanks. He works, his work has appeared in the Asahi Simbum, the Financial Times and Nikki Weekly, uh, among several others. Uh, Robert, you'll have around 20 to 25 minutes to make your initial remarks, which will be followed by question and answers. We'd like to request all our participants to drop their questions in the chat, uh, Zoom chat or comment box below the Facebook Live. Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Pramod. I'm extremely happy to be here with you. I mean, to be here in, uh, on the internet, obviously, sadly, not in person. And I hope one day I'll get to visit you in Kathmandu. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'll try to be fairly brief uh, and so as to give more time for questions and answers. Uh, and um, you know, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions or if I say something that's not uh, uh, very clear. Uh, and uh, I'm um, listening. So I'll start my, my talk is on Abe and Japan and, and South Asia. Um, I think first we have to see that historically uh, Japan has not been a particularly important actor in, in South Asia and South Asia has not played a major role in Japanese foreign policy, Japanese security policy. Uh, Japan from the 1630s to the 1850s lived in semi-seclusion. It had a limited intercourse with China and with Korea, as well as even more uh, limited trade uh, with the Netherlands. Uh, and that was about it. Uh, the links that existed with South Asia were through Portugal, because Portugal had been um, one of the first countries to establish ties with Japan in the 16th century, and Portugal was also an important power at the time in the Indian Ocean. Uh, Goa was until uh, the mid 20th century uh, Portuguese holding in South Asia. Uh, one of the, some of the first cannons that arrived in Japan uh, came from Portuguese Asia, but otherwise the links to South Asia were very limited, except of course if you go back to more ancient history and one that still is very important in Japanese culture, uh, Buddhism uh, came from South Asia, but it came through and mediated via, via China. Uh, as Japan uh, uh, ended its seclusion, forced, as its seclusion was forcibly ended by Western imperialism, uh, it gradually became an important uh, player in Northeast Asia, uh, became a colonial power. It acquired Taiwan uh, in the wake of its victory over China and Korea following its defeat of Russia. Uh, and then of course, uh, 
later became an even greater uh, power in the region. Uh, the one um, episode in Japanese history that did um, reverberate in South Asia uh, was the 1905 victory of Japan against Russia. Uh, this inspired South Asian independence uh, movements um, as well as uh, independence movements in other parts of the world as well as African Americans uh, because for the first time uh, they saw uh, non-Western or non-quote-unquote white power uh, defeat one of the major uh, European slash white powers in the world, that is the Russian Empire. Uh, later on um, in World War II, uh, Japan of course fought in what was called Burma, now called Myanmar, against the British Commonwealth. Um, Japanese aircraft bombed uh, Ceylon, as it was called at the time, Sri Lanka. Uh, but even there, South Asia was a secondary importance uh, to the war uh, that Japan fought against uh, the Allies uh, from 1931 in the case of China, from 1941 in the case of the Western powers. Uh, and if you look at the South Asian side, uh, the uh, relationship with Japan was also fairly uh, limited. Uh, the invaders uh, in, in South Asia came mostly from Central Asia or from Europe. Uh, the cultural ties uh, were first uh, to the region, uh, to Europe as a result of colonization, uh, first the Portuguese and then first and foremost, of course, uh, the British uh, to the Muslim world uh, for Muslims in the region. Uh, and more recently through immigration and other ties uh, to the United States. Uh, there have been some changes uh, in, um, in recent decades. Uh, one has been migration. There are now some South Asian migration, uh, migrants in uh, Japan. Actually, they are relatively speaking uh, by Japanese standards, a fair number of Nepalese, I think about 50,000, of course, maybe more, of course, in, compared to other countries, Japan still has very few immigrants. Uh, there is on the Japanese side an interest in South Asia as a production base and as a market, both as an alternative to China and just as a new area to develop. Uh, and at the same time, there's an interest in um, South Asia uh, in getting more Japanese investment and also an interest, but again, in a, in a, compared to other parts of the world, really limited interest in Japan as a place to which um, individuals can migrate. And Japan, because of its very uh, low demography, is very much in need of immigrants. Uh, the strategic interest, uh, then obviously there it's difficult to talk of South Asia as a whole uh, because different countries have different interests. Uh, in terms of the largest player in the region, that is India, uh, the shared strategic interest is to counter China. Uh, that is what has motivated a Japanese interest in greater defense cooperation and strategic dialogue with India. Uh, and this is something which obviously is of interest uh, to Indian policy makers. Uh, you see that and in, in to, to go from the economy to the military field, uh, we've seen gradually uh, an increase in uh, dialogues between Japan and India in, on strategic affairs, two plus two meetings, that is defense and foreign ministers. Uh, also sometimes uh, military exercises, either just between Japan and India or with other countries, essentially the United States or Australia, uh, participating in these. Uh, these mirror uh, a US interest in India, uh, again, as a country that can be a partner against China and an interest on the Indian side in a stronger relation, security relationship with the United States. Uh, this has really been going on uh, for several decades. Uh, it's still in relative terms limited. That is, India is not one of the tier one US 
strategic and military partners. There are no U.S. troops stationed on permanent basis in India. Uh, there is no alliance mechanism of the sort that exists in NATO with, in, with Japan, with South Korea, with Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Indian, um, the Indian uh, armed forces have acquired, purchased weapons in the United States, but Russia remains an important supplier. Uh, so as much as there's a certain convergence of interest between on, the, on one side India and the other, Japan and um, the United States and Australia, uh, we have to put it in the context, in the, in the context of relations which are still not embryonic, they're more developed, but they're nothing like what exists uh, between major allies. Uh, in the Japanese case, I think it's important also to remember that Japan has almost no power projection in South Asia. That is, the United States, to a lesser extent, even Australia could develop, could deploy forces in India. This is not going to happen in the Japanese case. I mean, Japan has a navy, some vessels could be deployed there, but there are political obstacles, Japan's reluctance to get involved in conflicts, and also the fact that the vast majority of Japan's uh, defense forces are focused on the threats that the country faces in its immediate neighborhood that is in Northeast Asia. Uh, and on the other side, India is not going to deploy forces to Northeast Asia in any significant measure. Uh, we also uh, need to take into account the fact that even though China is obviously viewed as a threat by many Indian policymakers, uh, Pakistan also is in this category of potential enemies for India. There's a long history of animosity, several wars uh, fought between uh, India and Pakistan. Um, recently, the dispute over Kashmir has heated up. Uh, so it's not like India is solely focused on China. Uh, and when you look at US policy, uh, the United States has a complex but close relation, security relationship with Pakistan, and that's something that needs to be entered in the equation. And on the Japanese side, finally, uh, if you take the, the broader picture, uh, we have to understand that Abe is perceived both by his supporters and his opponents as being a quote-unquote militarist, as someone who has ditched Japan's uh, post-1945 tradition, so recent tradition of pacifism. Uh, but in fact, he's only made very gradual changes. Uh, first, Japan's security policy changed uh, well before Abe. And secondly, under Abe, we see that resources allocated to national defense have not grown uh, significantly we see that Japan remains very, very reluctant, not only to use force, but also even to threaten to use force. Uh, so Japan's activities in the security realm start with a premise that unless it is directly threatened, uh, Japan will not use military force. That's very different from the posture with the United States has had since the 1940s, uh, that's very different in, in, the Asia, in the Asia Pacific region from that of Australia, which again has not only deployed forces, but fought in several wars that did not directly involve Australian survival. Uh, the war in Korea, the war in Vietnam, uh, two conflicts in Iraq, uh, one in Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, there you can argue that Australian national interests were involved, but so were Japanese ones, and Japan uh, never participated as a combatant in um, any of these conflicts. Japan sent some forces uh, to engage in water uh, purification in Iraq after the end of major hostilities, but unlike Australia, uh, Japanese soldiers, sailors, and airmen did not fight uh, in the wars in Iraq, nor did they do so in Afghanistan. So we're still dealing with a country that is, in terms of security policy, extremely careful. We also, when it comes to Japan, 
uh, in a country that has an enormous demographic problem, that is the population is, is already aged and is aging very rapidly. Uh, every year there are far more deaths than births in Japan. Uh, immigration has in no way compensated for this. Uh, Japan does not perceive itself as a rising power. Uh, and as much as some Japanese policymakers would like the country to be more involved in uh, security uh, policy, they would like it to be more involved internationally, to carry more weight. Uh, the resources they're willing to allocate to this remain very limited. Uh, Japan devotes maybe 1.3%, depending how you count, 1%, 1.2%. Uh, to its national defense, uh, that's relatively little. Now, maybe that's enough, but the fact is it's relatively little. Uh, its uh, acquisition of defense equipment, mean, the way it acquires defense equipment means that per unit prices are very high. Uh, again, there are good reasons for this. Uh, and this reflects fundamentally the fact that Japanese voters uh, are not in favor of a more muscular foreign and security policy that the voters want resources allocated to their pensions, uh, to healthcare, uh, not to the military, uh, that many of the politicians that view themselves as hawkish have actually internalized a lot of the post-1945 values uh, that make resorting to force almost unacceptable unless you're directly threatened. Uh, so that's, I think, puts a limit to what Japan can do in the international arena, arena in defense and security policy. In economic terms, it's very different. I think there's a real potential for even more Japanese investment in the region, uh, both for Japanese companies to use South Asia as a manufacturing base, but also to develop infrastructure in South Asia. Uh, Japan is known throughout the world for very high quality infrastructure uh, that may be more expensive than what is provided by China, but is often of a higher quality, uh, is uh, better maintained. Uh, so Japan could, could, and I think it's starting to play a role there. And of course, uh, as South Asia's economies grow, uh, they become a more important market for Japan. And at the same time, as Japan needs more immigrants, some of them can come from South Asia, but Japan is not probably, at least in the short or medium term, going to become a major uh, destination for immigration from South Asia, at least nothing that compares to the Arabian Gulf states, to Europe, uh, to the United States, and to other parts of the world, to Australia. Um, so that's um, how I'd like to start. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to expand on this. Uh, uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, uh, it was really an interesting presentation. It was very comprehensive and, and we benefited a lot. You have touched upon different aspects of Japan's security policy and we have got lots of questions on similar lines. So let me start with the first question. How Japan is going to tackle its security issues with regard to North Korean missiles and problem in this partly island where many countries have stakes? I think, um, you know, the, the North Korean missile issue and the nuclear, uh, North Korean nuclear weapon issue, fundamentally, as far as you look at it from a Japanese point of view, is handled by the United States. Uh, uh, North Korea's negotiating partner on this issue is the US. It's not Japan. Uh, Japan has invested some resources in missile defense. I do not know enough uh, to have to pass judgment on whether how good this is or not. But the fact is that Japan's def deterrence in case of a North Cor Japan's deterrence policy when it comes to preventing North Korea from attacking is based on the U.S. deterrent, namely the belief that if North Korea were to attack. Uh, Japan, especially with nuclear weapons, the United States would retaliate. Uh, so North Korea is fundamentally a U.S. problem managed by Japan. From time to time, Japanese governments have tried to have some influence on this. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Koizumi went to North Korea, uh, but Japan can offer money. 
sorry, could offer money to, to North Korea, uh, but it cannot offer it the security guarantee it craves. It cannot offer it the recognition that it wants to get from the United States. Uh, so Japan is in a position of essentially having subcontracted this to the USA and has to hope uh, that Washington is doing what's right for Japan, which obviously with the type of man who's in the White House is something which every Japanese policymaker should be concerned about. And the second half of your question was? Uh, the, the Spartly Islands. Well, the Spartly Islands are the South China Sea. No, there's the Japanese view on this is that China has been aggressive has not respected international laws and international norms, uh, but that uh, the uh, um, but there's very little that Japan can do. I mean, Japan has provided some assistance to the Coast Guard, uh, Coast Guards of Southeast Asian states, Vietnam, the Philippines, uh, but Japan is never going to go kinetic. That is, Japan is not going to start a conflict over this. I mean, China could take over every South China Sea island, uh, including those that are already held by other countries, and Japan is not going to take the lead in fighting China. Uh, so besides some economic assistance to Southeast Asia, uh, this is fundamentally an issue for the US. I mean, it's, it's an issue for lots of other countries, but as for the countries that are if, if Japanese interests are threatened in the South China Sea, Tokyo just has to hope that the US will undertake actions that are consistent with Japan's national interest. What these actions are is not clear. Uh, if the United States were to physically confront China on the South China Sea, you have to ask yourself, how does this play out? Uh, which countries in the region would actually send military forces to support the US? That's a good question. It's not obvious. Even would Australia go? Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, would Japan itself send its navy? I don't know. Uh, India is even less obvious. Uh, what, are the, what would be the red lines? And also the issue in Southeast Asia is that if you look at the other claimant states, uh, Philippines is a US ally, but the Philippines uh, has a very weak military. It has a government that one day seems to be siding with the US and the other day seems to prefer China. Uh, it has very high levels of corruption. Uh, of all the, the other claimant countries, the one that has probably the strongest military uh, and, sh and surely a, a very, very impressive military tradition is Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam is far from being fully an ally of the United States. Uh, and if you were talking about, it's unclear to me that even the Vietnamese government would want the US to go to war and say, retake uh, the Spartleys, for example, of the Paracels uh, from Vietnam, because you know, this would probably mean a, a major war with China. And it's unclear to me that this is what Hanoi wants. Uh, and then the other participants, the other countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, have smaller claims in the region. Uh, again, they're not US allies. I mean, they have sometimes good relations with the US, but it's more complex. The, in, the Southeast Asia, in Southeast Asia, the nation with the strongest military ties with the United States is Singapore, but Singapore, again, surely clearly doesn't want war in the South China Sea. And Singapore itself does not have um, maritime disputes with China. And then there's Taiwan, but that's another issue also. Uh, there is another interesting question. Uh, is it possible for Japan to join hands with China to secure its regional stability as it is neighbor rather than relying someone out of the, out of the region? Well, it's, you know, is it physically possible for Japan to rely only on itself for its security? Yes. Uh, Japan's economy is smaller than that of China, but Japan's economy is far more advanced technologically, uh, industrially, uh, its society, it's stronger. Uh, it has the advantages of being a liberal capitalist economy, unlike uh, China. So Japan alone could surely stand up to China. The question is, does, do the Japanese voters, does the Japanese government want to say devote 5% of its GDP to national defense? I mean, it could, 
physical, I mean, there's, there are countries that are in far worse economic shape than Japan that have a far larger part of their resources devoted to national defense. Uh, how long would it take to build that military? And would it really be better for Japan than to rely on the US? And I think the answer is you no. Know, at one point, I think given the, the danger that Donald Trump represents, yes, uh, at one point, I think Japanese would have to say to themselves, look, we can't rely on the US. The US has gone bananas, has become a banana republic. Uh, and we can't rely on the Americans. But I think the feeling right now in Tokyo is that despite all the problems with Trump, Japan can still rely on the US. And I think that's based both on an analysis of the situation that the alliance has so far survived. And secondly, on a feeling that the alternative to the US that is to stand alone is too costly, too difficult, and that it's better not to look really not to look at the problem and just assume everything is fine in Washington. Uh, there's another question uh, which many of the NIPTIs often talk about is, uh, will Japan cooperate with India and US to enhance connectivity project in South Asia to counter China's BRI? Well, I think everybody is interested in, in countering that BRI and that surely is one of the ideas between Japan's uh, uh, freedom of the uh, the India Freedom of uh, Indo-Pacific Area, um, FIOP or whatever. The, uh, the question is, what does it entail? It's first, to some extent, the Belt and Road Initiative has been used by those who see China as a threat, and I, I think they're very good arguments saying China is a threat, as kind of a red flag you agitate behind, in front of a bull saying, look, the Chinese are here, they're a threat. In some cases, the BRI is not a threat because it involves countries that are of marginal importance, uh, not, not in South Asia, but say in Africa, uh, to Japan and the United States. In some cases, the BRI provides infrastructure that other countries can use. You know, they've improved ports in Sri Lanka, but this allows US destroyers to make port calls in Sri Lanka because they can use the ports. Uh, even if China owns them, at one point they can be nationalized. You know, the, uh, the Suez Canal uh, was uh, built by Europeans. One day Nasser decided the, ca the canal is ours and the canal became Egyptian. Uh, so the infrastructure you can't take out, but the ownership you can. Uh, now, you know, is China going to invade? I mean, you know, it's an interesting question. If one day the Pakistani government took over Chinese port assets in, uh, Pakistan? I mean, would the Chinese Navy go there and land like the Marines used to do uh, in Central America and the Caribbean? I don't know. It's not obvious. Uh, the question also with this connectivity is what makes economic sense? Who's going to pay for it? Uh, they are clearly uh, some of these BRI projects, and this is not unique to China, or what's known in the United States as white elephant projects, which I don't know whether the term is used in South Asia because they're actually elephants in South Asia, uh, where they're not native to the US. No, white elephant projects are projects that are very expensive, very prestigious, and serve no purpose. So I think the, the, the goal of the Japanese government uh, is to try to offer infrastructure projects that are economically feasible, of higher quality, more sustainable, uh, and this is what they've been trying to do, for example, in Indonesia, where China won a contract for a railroad and finally it fell through. And I think, I'm, I'm, I don't know the details, that Japan ended up getting it. So I think, yes, in South Asia, I mean, basically the, the, in, the Japanese interest in infrastructure in South Asia is not only countering the Belt and Road Initiative, but is making it easier for Japanese businesses to operate in the region. One challenge, of uh, for large scale investment in South Asia is the lack of connectivity, uh, roads, uh, train, uh, railroads, uh, and everything. So it's in the Japanese interest to develop this infrastructure in South Asia so that then Japanese companies can invest in the region. 
Uh, like you talked about Indo-Pacific, so let me talk, uh, raise that question. How important is quadrilateral security dialogue in the Japanese strategy to counter China in South China? There are lots of questions on the role of Japan in the future of Quad. You know, I, I think the Quad is, you know, you talk about the Quad. The thing is, I think things to, to remember about this is that obviously to discuss strategic interests or share concern about China, uh, the combination of the US, Australia, India, and Japan makes sense. You know, you could conceivably, I think at one point, uh, add Canada and have several European countries or the EU uh, slash NATO, uh, because I mean, Canada is also a Pacific power and has an interest in what's happening in the region. Uh, the EU actually is a Pacific power because they're uh, French possessions in the region, but also because the EU, first and foremost, has economic interests in the region. Uh, so that's, as a form for discussion, yes. But you have to take into account first, these, the Indo-Pacific is a very, very large area. So, you know, to go from Australia to Japan is essentially like going from Zimbabwe uh, to Italy. It's not next door. I mean, there's a tendency, I think, that folks outside the region say, well, Australia, Japan, they're all in the Asia Pacific region. No, it, it's not like Belgium and the Netherlands. Uh, second, when you look at these four countries, the US has this enormous power projection ability. That is, the United States can project land, sea, uh, and air power anywhere in the world fairly quickly and on a very massive scale. Uh, you know, if, if the US want, if China and India went to war and the US wanted to assist India, the India could quickly, the US could quickly, uh, without thinking about the nuclear aspect, in terms of conventional weapons, bring a lot to bear. Uh, the, the three other countries in question, Japan has, first as a military that is not oriented towards power projection. And secondly, most Japanese voters don't want to hear about this. Uh, Australia has an expeditionary uh, military. It's a long history, uh, starting with Australians fighting in, in Europe during the First World War more than 100 years ago. Uh, but at the same time, though Australia's uh, military is known to be a very high quality, uh, it's war fighting experience, it's not that large. So you know, how much can Australia deploy either in South Asia or in Northeast Asia, that's fairly limited. And then it's not only deployed, but sustain these forces. Um, so that's, and then India, India's military, obviously because of India's history since independence of having been involved in wars with its neighbors, essentially Pakistan and India, has some expeditionary uh, ability as we, we saw at one point in the Maldives, for example, India is not going to deploy power to Northeast Asia. Now, in case of a global conflict with China, yes, you no, know, India would be fighting China on one side, Japan and the US on the other, but there are limits to this. I mean, this is a long, long way from being what NATO is. And also their perception of the interests is different. Uh, you know, Japan, Australia and the United States don't care about Pakistan as a threat, except in the US is concerned sometimes about what happens to the, to the Pakistani nuclear weapons. Uh, North Korea is not really on the Indian radar screen. Um, so there again, you have differences. So it's, you know, it's, 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 it's something that's important, but it must be seen in the context of some limits. Um, like you said that uh, Indo-Pacific is a very vast area and there are four countries. Uh, India, Japan, US, and Australia, but are they on the same plane? Uh, does their idea or vision of Indo-Pacific converse? You know, I think the truth is, you know, the, the, the is, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific, which is what free up comes from. This is to some extent a Japanese slogan, uh, similar to the term arc of democracy and prosperity or freedom and prosperity. Uh, that Taro Aso developed at one point. What it means in plain English is we're trying to get allies and partners to contain China. That's what it means. It's about China. It's not about anything else. Uh, and the attraction to India is that 
a lot of Indian analysts now see China as a threat. Uh, but you know, does Japan have a concept for the Indian Ocean and the Pacific? I think the answer is no. I mean, first, the Indian Ocean is very far from Japan. Japan has almost no history there. So, you know, you saw it uh, after the, um, there's a Japanese oil tanker that uh, sank off the coast of Mauritius. Uh, you know, it's in the Indian Ocean. I think the consensus is that the Japanese reaction to this has been considerably limited, uh, given the fact that the Japanese tanker, uh, because it's, so, you know, I don't think Japan has really a concept of India. You know, does India have a concept for the Pacific? Again, that's not clear to me. This is not part of the strategic, the area most Indian policymakers and strategists have been focused on for several generations. Uh, and you know, if you expand the Indian Ocean up to South Africa, it's, it's only far, but this, these are countries that have very little in common. You know, what do, what do Indonesia and Mozambique share? Uh, in terms of interests, in terms of uh, ties, the answer is close to zero. So it's uh, it's basically the big issue is uh, is um, is China for them. Um, like another question is uh, there like uh, our former Nepalese ambassador to France. He also served in Japan. Uh, Mohan Krishna Sahasta, he has raised a question that Japan is under US security umbrella. And that is the reason why Japan has achieved economic development. Japan is surrounded by three nuclear countries in, uh, in view of long term security. So his question is, will Japan consider to increase her defense capability by herself to face eventuality? What do you think? Well, I, I think, yes, yeah, I mean, the uh, Prime Minister Yoshida, who was Prime Minister during most of the US occupation, which lasted from 1945 to 1952, and is a man who set the Japan on a particular track after the war, believed that Japan should focus on economic development, be relatively uh, uninvolved in security policy, to develop its military, but not invest too much, and rely on the US. This has basically remained Japanese policy. I mean, yes, Japan now has a larger military. It plays a bigger role in the world than the 50s. That makes sense. Its economy is in relative terms, in absolute terms, much larger. Uh, but relying on the US remains its uh, primary policy, as is the case really for Western Europe. Now, you know, is this why Japan could achieve economic development? This is it's hard to prove because you can't run a parallel experiment. That is, to be able to answer this question, you would need to have two countries exactly like Japan, one investing more in its defense and the other less. Uh, you know, if the fact that Japan invested mostly, say, between 1%, more or less around 1% or 1.5, or if you include everything, 1.3 of its GDP on defense, obviously helped it compared to countries that are at say 10 or 15%. You know, if Japan had, since the 1960s, at least since it became wealthier, so 60s, invested three or 4% in national defense, would it be poorer? It's not obvious. I mean, uh, the United States has done this, has it done it harm? It's not, again, some say yes, some say no. I mean, national defense, to some extent is a form of Keynesian spending. It's money you spend on salaries and on equipment, which is mostly domestically produced in, in industrialized countries. So it's essentially a form of subsidy for employment for certain industries. So in that, in that sense, it lowers other expenditures. You know, if you have conscription, it means you have all other things being equal, you have fewer young people unemployed, so you don't need to pay unemployment benefits. Uh, national defense spending also uh, makes a very big contribution to technology. If you look at Silicon Valley, which is a monument to American technology, I mean, Silicon Valley it has two parents. One is economic liberalism, that is the freedom of immigration. I mean, as 
Silicon Valley would not exist if the U.S. had not historically been fairly open to immigration. I mean, the, we have South Asians uh, run Google, they run Microsoft, uh, they run a lot of other businesses in the region, in, in the Valley, but not only South Asians, East Asians, Europeans, South Americans, they're people from all over the world. Uh, Silicon Valley is a product of the freedom to invest, of the freedom to go bankrupt, of the freedom to fire people, the freedom to hire people, uh, the freedom to uh, create venture capital. But it's also, so freedom is kind of the, one of the parents of Silicon Valley, but the other parent of Silicon Valley is American defense spending. Uh, since 1940, the US has had a relatively large defense budget fluctuating from extremely large during World War II to much smaller nowadays, with a lot of emphasis on technology, because the U.S. way of war has been to invest in capital so as not to have to invest too much in labor. In other words, to minimize the number of, of Americans killed, but also to have a relatively small military in terms of the number of soldiers, sailors, and, and airmen, uh, and Marines. Uh, as a result, an enormous amount of investment has flowed into technology. Uh, the first venture capital firm in the United States was created by a retired general. Uh, the U.S. intelligence agencies engage in venture capital in Silicon Valley. Uh, so you wouldn't have Silicon Valley if, if, if the U.S. had the same defense posture as Japan. There would be no Silicon Valley there would be no American high tech sector. You can see this, of course, in commercial aviation. I mean, Boeing wouldn't be what Boeing is if it weren't for defense spending. Uh, so I, I, the, the real gain that Japan got from having a low security profile is that Japan's relations with East Asia after World War II would have been much more complex uh, because Japan had been the aggressor in the 30s and early 40s. Uh, if Japan had become an autonomous power, it would have been much more difficult for it to be reaccepted into the region. What the U.S. did for Japan more than save it money was to allow Japan to tell other countries in the region, look, we've stopped being in the, in the war business. The Americans take care of this. We are a peaceful trading nation. Uh, so it has allowed Japan not to have to deal with a lot of these national security dilemmas. Uh, it has allowed Japan not to have to develop a national security apparatus in terms of intelligence, policy making. So in that sense, as long as the U.S. has had the right policies, it's helped Japan enormously because it's meant that this is one area of statecraft it didn't have to get involved in. Uh, let me raise one specific question which has come from our Nepalese audience. Uh, the question is like, uh, what are core concern of Japan in Nepal? Core concern of Japan in Nepal? Well, I'll be honest, I unfortunately know relatively little about Nepal. Uh, my assumption is that the main concerns which Japan has is are somewhat along the lines that India has regarding Nepal's relationship with China. I think when, a Jap Japan, I think when Japanese government looks at foreign countries, one of the first things that it focuses on is the nature of their ties with China. Are they quote unquote on the Chinese side or are they on the Japan US side? Uh, that's the lens through which it views it the same way that during the Cold War, one of the first questions the United States asked itself about any nation was where do they stand on the spectrum of being 100 pro-Soviet, 100% pro-American, or somewhere in between. So I think that's probably the primary concern uh, for Japan. Uh, the other question is, what, development, uh, what developments under Abe amount to a radical change in Japan's security policy? Do you perceive Japan's security policy in the Abe era as a radical transformation or an evolutionary shift? I think they're very much uh, uh, an evolutionary shift. Uh, I think, what has Abe done? Okay, in terms of hardware, he slightly increased the defense budget, but nothing radical. Uh, security policy, Japan has passed laws that make it a little easier for Japan to take part in military actions 
if Japan's national, vital national interests are threatened, even though Japan itself is not under attack. Uh, these are very technical discussions. What impact they have on policy making and on posture, I don't know, because if you take the scenario in which, for example, the United States is involved in a war with North Korea, you know, the Japanese decision on how to help the US, whether to fight on the US side, or especially if it involves, and even more if it involves China, will not be based on laws that were passed by parliament. They will be based on what Japanese policymakers think makes sense for Japan and what they believe the Japanese public will accept. Uh, so I don't think these are revolutionary uh, changes. Uh, Abe has traveled a lot, uh, so he's very much tried to show the Japanese flag everywhere. Uh, what this has brought, I don't know. Uh, I think actually the most important action that Abe took, the one that is different from what Japan had done in the past is a negotiation of TPP without the United States. Uh, the United States had led the way for this TPP agreement, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, President Trump decided to leave it. I mean, it had not yet been ratified, but to basically abandon it. Uh, this was a blow to Japan, partly on economic grounds, but more important on security grounds, because Japan saw this as a way to create a block to balance China. And Abe managed to negotiate a TPP with every country, including the, excluding the US, which had left, called the Comprehensive uh, Trade Partnership. I forgot the exact acronym. And then he negotiated a trade deal with the United States, which is somewhat similar to the TPP. So it holds the hope that the US could join TPP at one point, or at least it's gotten him in two parts what he wanted, that is a treaty a trade treaty that links Japan and a lot of countries in the region and still a good a, a deal with the United States. And it's, it's rare for, the, for Japan to take the lead on um, international multilateral negotiation. Generally, the Japanese uh, role is to participate, but mostly to focus on Japanese interests, but not be overly involved on the big picture. But here it was Japan uh, being a leader uh, very, very successfully. I think that will be one of Abe's uh, major achievements in the international realm. I think in terms of defense policy, we've seen gradual changes, uh, but nothing radical. And some of these incremental changes would probably have taken place under any other LDP prime minister. Uh, there's another question, uh, like why have Japanese strategic documents during the second Abe administration been harsh on North Korea and soft on Russia? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think there's several things. I think a, a lot of Japanese policymakers think that China is the number one enemy. North Korea is an enemy too, but a smaller one. And that therefore the goal is to bring Russia away from its um, partnership with China and to bring it back, if not into the pro-Japan, pro-US camp, at least to untie it from China. Uh, secondly, for a variety of I think rational and irrational emotional reasons, uh, Abe has believed that he could do a deal with Russia over what's known as the Northern Territories of Southern Kurais. These are two islands and two groups of small islands, generally referred together as four islands, even though they're smaller islets really, uh, that were occupied by the Soviet Union following in the wake of the Soviet intervention during the Second World War in uh, August 1945. The Japanese side has claimed that these four islands, unlike the more northern Kurais, were part of the Japanese home islands and not part of the Kurais that the Soviets occupied, and therefore the Soviet Union has no legitimate claim to them. Uh, numerous Japanese administrations have tried to do a deal. One was almost done in the 50s, but scuttled, partly due to US intervention. Uh, Abe seems to have believed that he could quote unquote do a deal. 
Uh, most analysts think that this is not possible, that there's no way that Russia would return these islands, uh, and that uh, Putin has dangled some hope from time to time in front of Abe uh, to induce him to continue negotiations and to still be relatively soft on Russia, which Japan has, has been. So I think the Northern Territory is already one reason. I think Abe very much hoped that one of his legacies would be the return of these islands, or at least an agreement to at one point return them. Um, his father, who had been foreign minister, had tried to reach a settlement with Russia. So there's a family uh, history involved in this. Um, and I think that's what mostly explains it. I think um, so far it's been a, a failure. Um, uh, another is why have Jap uh, like how has Abe's government been able to pursue its ambitious security agenda while avoiding the domestic political blacklash that threatens previous prime ministers? Well, Abe, I think the key question there is why has Abe been able to stay in power for so long? I think it's partly the absence of well, the opposition is very weak for a variety of reasons. So there's not much opposition outside of the ruling LDP party. And within the LDP, uh, he has a strong support base. He doesn't have a credible opponent. Uh, and so he's managed to outlast, to, to, to remain prime minister for a very long time. He's beaten the record uh, held by his uh, late grand uncle, Prime Minister Sato. Uh, but I think it's been more the result of the weakness of his opponents than of his strength. Uh, Abe is not a particular, I mean, his popularity has gone up and down, now it's more down. He's never been extremely popular. He's never been seen as a charismatic uh, figure. So it's more a victory by default. Uh, of course, he has the advantage of lineage. His father was a uh, foreign minister. His grandfather was prime minister. His grand uncle was prime minister. Uh, he has a brother in politics, uh, and that helps a lot. Uh, there's one question from a Bhutanese, Bhutanese scholar. He says that the embassy of Japan in India is accredited to Bhutan. In this context, Japanese chairman of the Standing Committee of Foreign Affairs of the House of Representatives from, from Japan, Katsuyuki Kawai, proposed to open their embassy in Thimpu, but still it is in limbo. So how do you look at it? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, there has been a Japanese, uh, there has been a Japanese interest in opening uh, new embassies uh, in Africa, for example, to deal with the perceived Chinese inroads uh, to in, um, in Africa. So I assume the interest in Bhutan is the same thing. Uh, Mr. Kawai himself is right now in prison, uh, so he, I'm sure, has other preoccupations uh, that are more important to him than Bhutan or anything else. He, he and his wife were accused of violating uh, election laws and of buying votes, uh, so they were arrested uh, in June, uh, and I believe he's still physically in, uh, in jail right now. So. It is, they, as far as he's concerned, I mean, Kawai is obviously not uh, involved in this anymore. Uh, another question is, is there a possibility of Japan teaming up with ASEAN member states to find a collective solution between the states and China in South China Sea? No, I think, you know, the, the, the dispute over South China Sea uh, it involves China, it involves several Southeast Asian countries and Taiwan as well. Uh, this is not something which Japan could mediate because it's perceived by China as a hostile power. So it's not going to arrive as an honest broker, even if it wanted to. Uh, and and yeah, I don't see China agreeing to any sort of negotiation like this because the Chinese position is that this is Chinese territory, and it's much better for China to deal bilaterally with every other claimant 
than multilaterally because uh, that would negate some of the advantages that China has uh, due to its size and strength. Uh, there's another question, like uh, it, many people have asked this. What are the major security policy of Japan in South Asia? What is Japan's view on South Asia? And there are lots of questions on each country, like how do Japan look at Sri Lanka? Or there are some questions, how, look, how does uh, Japan look at Nepal and Pakistan and others? You know, I think they're all different. Uh, you know, Bangladesh is important. Uh, now it's a very important textile industry. I don't know to what extent uh, there are Japanese investments in textile. Uh, Sri Lanka, I think the focus has been on what are perceived Chinese inroads uh, in the region, uh, as well um, as the ports. I mean, that's I think the main focus. Uh, India, obviously, is the largest country in South Asia uh, as a potential ally against China. I think Nepal, uh, they look at it through the China lens. Uh, and Pakistan, you know, Japan is not involved in the security aspect. In other words, you know, the United States has a strong interest in Pakistan. It doesn't want it to go to war with India and vice versa. Uh, Pakistan plays an important role in uh, in Afghanistan, uh, it's a neighbor of Iran. Uh, at the same time, it has a very strong Islamist movement, some of which have been involved in a variety of violent operations overseas in, in India and in other places. Uh, that's really not something Japan is active in. I mean, Japan is obviously interested in, I mean, prefers that there be peace and war, but Japan's means to influence this are very limited. Uh, Oh, sorry. sorry, I was muted. Yeah, I'm back. I think again, in the, in the case of Pakistan, one one um, Japanese interest is the extent of Chinese uh, penetration in Pakistan and how Japan can be involved and in, can counteract this. Uh, there's another interesting question that Japan is an economic power and technologically most advanced country. Is there demand, even by a small group, to possess nuclear weapons because it would be a strong deterrent against China or its enemies? Won't it be more useful than paying such a huge amount to the United States? You know, I think uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Japan's nuclear interest in nuclear weapons uh, is uh, like the Loch Ness monster. In other words, it doesn't really exist, but from time to time you have individuals who say, oh, you know, I saw the Loch Ness Monster. So from time to time you have this thing, you know, Japan's interested in nuclear weapons. And the thing with nuclear weapons is it's not a yes or no. I mean, let's say Japan, I mean, Japan could easily develop nuclear weapon. It has a lot of uh, plutonium. Uh, it has a variety of uh, satellite launchers that could become, um, missiles, uh, it has aircraft which could be adapted to uh, launch nuclear uh, bombs. Uh, I assume maybe they could be put in the conventional submarines, I don't know about this, uh, but it's not just a question of nuclear weapons. It's first you need the population to be in favor of it. I think most Japanese voters don't want Japan to have nukes. Second question is what do you do with them? Um, you use them for deterrence, use them for deterrence against China. Does it really provide more deterrence than US nuclear weapons? But uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, does it make you more of a target? And of course, between the time you say you're developing a nuclear arsenal and the time you have one, uh, you're even more vulnerable. Now, of course, you could do it secretly, but sooner or later it would get noticed by Chinese intelligence. Uh, you also would need to develop targeting mechanisms, command and control mechanisms. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very complex endeavor. Uh, and last but not least, it would have to be accepted by the United States, except if you decided that the US was so unreliable and you uh, had essentially written off the US as an ally. And I think, again, with the uh, Donald Trump administration is, is so unpredictable and insane that it's hard to know what they would think. But, uh, I think that no U.S. administration will want Japan to have nuclear weapons. Historically, the U.S. Has, not, has been opposed to its allies acquiring nuclear weapons. Uh, 
as opposed to the UK and France doing it. Once they had it, the US helped them because they figured out better to help them um, and at least make sure that they don't waste too much money on this. Uh, in the case of Japan, maybe at one point it would have this uh, attitude, but you know, times have changed. Uh, I think the tendency in the US would be more to put pressure on Japan not to develop them. Uh, but I, th I think the most important thing is the Japanese public doesn't want it. And I guess conceivably you could do it secretly, but it's hard to believe it would remain a secret uh, for a long time. Uh, there's another question like Trump is asking Germany to pay more on defense. Uh, similarly, US is also asking Japan and South Korea to contribute greater share for securitizing them. What is Japan's response to it? Is there also a demand for uh, creating its own army in Japan? Well, I mean, Japan has an army. It's called the Self-Defense Forces, but de facto, it's an army. Uh, I think that, look, the US since the 1950s has wanted its allies uh, to devote more resources um, to uh, national defense. Uh, at the same time, the United States has always wanted to be the leader of the alliance, and that creates a certain uh, contradiction because for the U.S. to be the leader of the alliance, the U.S. has got to have by far the largest military. If the allies invest more and more in their defense, they would want to have more of a voice in how the alliance is, is run. Uh, that's one thing. Trump has made it more, uh, has more aggressively demanded that the allies pay more. I mean, every, every administration has always asked for more. Uh, the first thing, the first there will be negotiations with South Korea. Uh, how that will go, I don't know. I think it may be that the Trump administration wants to end the relation, the alliance with South Korea. I mean, that's a possibility. I think Trump himself has always been very critical of these alliances because he lacks the a, either the intellect to realize why they're so good for the U.S. or maybe he just thinks uh, that it's not in the U.S. interest to have allies and you, know, you have to take into account, of course, his uh, close relationship, an unexplained relationship, let's say, with Putin. Uh, so next will come the negotiation with the Japanese. I think they will be, I think to the extent that the Japanese government feels it can accommodate the U.S., it will do it because the US wants, the Japanese government wants the Americans to remain in Japan. Uh, if US demands are totally outrageous, I don't know. Uh, that's hard to predict. Uh, I mean, there's one point where even Japan would say no, perhaps because the voters would be uh, uh, against Japan writing a much, much larger check. Under any administration in the US other than Trump, I would have said, look, it will be acrimonious, there will be accusations on both sides, but at the end they'll reach an agreement because they both want one. Uh, if Trump is reelected, I have no idea what will happen. Anything is possible. And of course, if the alliance were broken by the United States, then the questions of how large Japan's military should be, whether it should have nuclear weapons, uh, all of these would be framed in a totally different context. Uh like uh, there's another very similar question because you said if Trump is elected. So we have one question like, uh, how will the upcoming US election impact Japan US relations if Trump continues or if a new uh, like uh, Democrats come to power, will there be any change in the relations? You know, I think if Trump is, is reelected, so far Japan has suffered less than other allies from the Trump presidency. I think the risk for Japan will be first Trump asking for much more money for what's known as host nation support. So putting in jeopardy the US basis in the region. Uh, the other problem will be the deal he wants to do with North Korea. That may be one that is really bad for Japanese interests. Uh, third, there's the relationship with China. I think Japan wants a harder line on China, but at the same time, no one in Tokyo uh, wants a total confrontation between the United States and China because uh, Japan has a 
strong interest in an economic relationship uh, with China, a direct one, indirect one through supply chains. I think with the Democrats, it would be more predictable. Uh, I think Biden may actually focus more on China as an enemy, but I think the approach of a Biden administration will be to take into account the interests of US allies, not because it's the generous thing to do, but because the US is far more powerful if it confronts China with its allies behind it, rather than takes positions that are so extreme that no one else within the alliance, of as the alliance with the answer Japan, Australia, uh, Europe, uh, support them. Uh, so I think with Biden, it will be more back to um, a normal uh, relationship of the sort that has existed and evolved uh, from the 1950s until uh, 2617 when Trump became president. Uh, there's another question like how Japan can ensure balance against China in order to sustain international order based on complex cooperation in this globalized era? Well, you know, Japan's contribution is its military, I mean, it has a small but potent, I mean, small relative to its size, potent military. So in that sense, it, it contributes to the US-led deterrence uh, against China. Uh, it contributes economically because it has a large economy. So it's, Japan is a major importer, exporter, a major investor overseas. Uh, in that sense, it upholds uh, the international system as it exists now. Uh, it's an important funder of international organizations. Uh, it provides infrastructure. Uh, I mean, it has an aid program, though it's actually, I think, declined in terms of, in absolute terms over the past decades. Uh, so in, in that way, yes, I mean, Japan makes a contribution to the international order, but it's not in the driver's seat because uh, it has made a choice to have a relatively low profile uh, compared to the size of its economy and the size of its population. There's one another interesting question. We had this question even in our previous uh, webinars on Japan. It says that I'm not an expert on Japanese affairs, but I find it quite surprising that Japan is under the umbrella of US, which bombed it. So what is your comment on it? Well, you know, the US bombed uh, several of its major allies. I mean, Germany, of course. Uh, Japanese voters and Japanese policymakers decided in 1945, and as the Cold War evolved, uh, that they were better off being allies of the United States than um, not being allies. You know, I mean, it's the history of international relations that countries that were enemies sometimes become allies and vice versa. Uh, you know, the, the United Kingdom burnt the White House in 1812. It later became one of the most important allies of the United States. Uh, almost every major US ally has at one point been involved in armed conflict uh, with the United States. Uh, not only Japan and Germany, but also Italy, the UK, uh, France, uh, Turkey in the form of the Ottoman Empire, or indirectly, uh, Spain. Uh, so that's, that's normal. Uh, we still have lots of questions, but we are running out of time. So let me pose the last question for today. How do you look at Japan-India naval exercise connotation in South China Sea? Well, I think there are way uh, to improve the ability of the navies to work together, to know each other. It's obviously sent a way to tell China that Japan and India have an interest in freedom of navigation in the region. Uh, so it, you know, it's a way for India to signal that it's, cons it's not only concerned with China's uh, activities on the Sino-Indian border, but also in the, in, in the South China Sea on the Pacific side uh, of the region. Uh, so it's, I think that's basically what it is. And it's, 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 it's a step, but again, you have to take into account the limitations of both India and Japan uh, as powers that can project uh, a military force and that have limited expeditionary capabilities. Uh, thank you, Robert. Thank you very much for, in, uh, for the interesting discussion. Uh, thank you for your time and enlightening presentation and discussion. I'm sure all our participants benefited from it. I learned a lot. Thank you once again. Uh, we hope to meet you in real uh, soon in some part of the world. 
I'd also like to thank all our participants who participated through Zoom or Facebook Live and shared interesting, interesting questions. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, if anybody uh, is interested in getting in touch with us, you can just Google us, uh, Robert DeJarek at Temple University, and you will see my email and you'll be able to get on our mailing lists. And thank you again for having me on this uh, program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.